Rabbi Mark Dratch is Executive Vice President Emeritus of the Rabbinical Council of America. His rabbinate spanned 22 years in congregations around the U.S., and he's had the unique privilege of having Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb as his father-in-law. He was a master. Words and psukim and midrashim and everything were like clay in his hands. Rabbi Dratch is also founder of JSafe, the Jewish Institute supporting an abuse-free environment. And he was an instructor of ethics at Yeshiva University, two recurring themes in his drushes over the years. A whole bunch of years ago, I came across a couple of cases of child abuse in the, in the, in the Jewish community, and I looked for opportunities to talk about uh, these interpersonal relationships, about protecting the weak and the innocent. In this delightful episode, broadcast from Eretz Yisrael, where Rabbi Drach now resides with his wife, Rachel. We talk about the history and evolution of the sermon. The sermon, going back to the 1940s and 1950s, was at least a half an hour long. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur was 45 minutes, was an hour. I mean, this was, uh, um, our attention span has changed. You could never give a sermon for half an hour. Today. We get to hear some gems of anecdotes of his encounters with the great Darshanim of yesteryear. Rabbi Herschel Schachter, J.J. Schachter's father, Tukhanu Livracha, was in charge of rabbinic placement at YU. And he was known as, a, as an orator from the, the, the previous generation of uh, the Bronx, and the, the heyday of the, of the Bronx rabbinate. So I once went in to see him and asked him, how is, how's it possible to get a great drusha every Shabbat? We talk about how to mine your personal experiences for drusha material. I remember being in Stanford, my son was uh, three or four years old, and he came up and I see him running back and forth on the beam of looking behind chairs, and, and he looked concerned. I said, what are you, what's going on, Sam? What's happening? He says, I'm looking for Hashem and I can't find him. And how to bounce back quickly from negative feedback about your sermon. But there were times when I went too far and I thought it was cute, but it insulted some people. And somebody came out with me actually right afterwards. And then I got up right after Musaf and apologized. It was such a joy and pleasure to discuss a topic Rabbi Drach has lived and loved his whole life. If you can comfort somebody who needs comfort or inspire somebody who needs inspiration or challenge somebody who needs challenge at that moment, there's nothing, there's nothing greater. I learned so much, and I'm sure you will too. So now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Rabbi Mark Dratch. First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's really it's yeah. a pleasure to meet you and to, and to get a chance to uh, talk about the things that we rabbis love to talk about. Uh, yeah. So, number one, and then our, our drushos as well. So it's uh, so it's great. Um, I've been very, very fortunate Um I grew up in a in a shul in, in Philadelphia where um, the rabbi was a very good uh, preacher, and um, he was bright, he was sharp, intelligent. He uh, had a good message and he delivered it well. So I I grew up. I was weaned on good sermons, and Which then uh, this was uh, called Shari Shemayim in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a whole other history lesson and discussion for for another time. Um, his name was Arnie Feldman, Wayu Musmach, going back many, uh, going back many, many years. Um, and uh, I was very, very fortunate uh, to have married um, Sarah Lamb, who was Rabbi Lamb's uh, daughter, and um, he was a master. He just um, he, words and psukim and midrashim and everything were like clay in his hands. And um, just sitting around the table or sitting next to him in shul, and he would look at something, and all of a sudden, just these gems and pearls would uh, would would come out. And, and my biggest regret is not writing them down right away, um, because many I remember, and there's many more that I don't that I don't remember. Um, but the things that you see online now um, in the Norman Lamb Sermon Archives at, at, at the yu.edu um, were files in his drawers in an upstairs bedroom that kind of just sat there. I mean, he prepared. He he told me at one at one time that he was very fortunate that um, he was the assistant rabbi or the associate rabbi at, at the Jewish Center with Rabbi Young. So he got to speak once every two weeks, and he took those two weeks very seriously. And he would start working uh, on his on his sermons two weeks in advance. And really give it a give them a lot of thought and, and a lot of energy and a lot of and a lot of effort and really develop themes. And from what I understand, people would come from blocks and blocks and miles around on Shabbat morning when he spoke uh, to be able to hear him to be able to hear him speak. Um, he told me once that there were three sermons that every, that every rabbi has: there's the sermon he wants to give, the sermon he delivers, and then the sermon he should have given. 
So, um, but he would sit, he would speak only from notes, and um, although he worked out uh, language and 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 the uh, the arc of the sermon over time, and um, on Saturday night he would sit down at his typewriter and type them out. So what you see now, the PDFs you see now online, are those sermons that he would type out on his typewriter every every Saturday night, and they were just sitting in the drawers, and. Uh, we would go and visit, and I would lock. I would excuse myself and lock myself away. And this was my uh, treasure chest. I mean, it was a, tre a treasure trove. Um, I was a little bit uh, upset when they wound up online because not everybody else was stealing my stuff. Um, but in the beginning, um, you know, I would read the sermons and think that oh, these are just uh, you can't improve on them. They're they're wonderful. They're great, and I would try to deliver them, and they fell flat. And they fell flat for me because it was not my style and it wasn't it wasn't my voice. But what I eventually learned from them was um, language, development of ideas, um, how to take a um, a muck or how to take a, a medrash or a rashi or a gemara, whatever it may be, and really work with it and develop it into something that was um, that was appropriate and that was a good foil for the message that um, that I that I wanted to deliver. Um, yeah. In when you time, said that you uh, you actually tried delivering his his sermons as as as, I, as your own or or in what way? Well, I would you? give him credit. I would give him credit for it, but uh, yeah. yeah, but you but basically using his text and uh, and his words and things and it just was not it was just not me. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an important that was an important lesson. Um, he told me once he was a a visitor in a, in, a, in a certain shul for Shabbat, and he the rabbi invited him to sit down next to him on the pulpit, so he accepted it. And the rabbi got up to speak, and he um, he took out a, a copy of um, of the Royal Reach, was the which is the first um, volume of collected sermons, and delivered that sermon without attribution while Rabbi Lamb was just sitting there. So that was a little bit, uh, uh, and that fits very well with the other story he once said, told me that uh, Rabbi was away for Shabbat and he's sitting in the shul and his, goes to his friend's shul and he listens to the sermon. It was wonderful. Afterwards, after davening, he goes over to his friend and says, that was such a wonderful drasha. I wish I had delivered it. And um, his rabbi friend said to him, don't worry, you will, you will. <laughs> uh, look, we look for inspiration all over the place. Um, and it's hard to find. To, to deliver a good sermon every week is really very, very challenging. Um, and so if you hear something good, um, you know, you like to borrow it or be inspired by it and, and use it. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, when I was first going into in, in, into the rabbinate, uh, Rabbi Herschel Schachter, J.J. Schachter's father, Zechron Livracha, was the um, rabbinic was in charge of rabbinic placement at YU, and he was known as a as an orator from the of the, of the previous generation of of the Bronx and the the heyday of the of the Bronx rabbinate. So I once went in to see him and asked him how is how is it possible to get a, a, a great drasha every Shabbat. So he looked at me, and he he had a very wonderful sense of humor as well, and a great sense of drush. So he looked at me, and he said, um, "You know, you go out and buy the sermon manuals. You know, ten dollars a volume, um, and you'll find one or two ideas that are that are worthwhile." Uh, which is not true, actually, because many of those old sermon manuals weren't worth even. You couldn't even find one or two good ideas. And he says, "And you can deliver them exactly as they're written." I said, "But Rabbi Shaki, you have to." What's your source? It's, uh, it's, it's plagiarism, maybe Ulla Olam, you know. He says, no, he says, look, you're never going to deliver them exactly the way they were written. And a Ganev is Kona <laughs> So uh, that was his, I re many years later, I, I saw him again and reminded him of the story. He says, oh, I never said such a thing. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we so look, we we try to be original and sometimes we're very fortunate. The inspiration comes and we can find our own voice and our own insights into something. Other times we borrow things. If I think if we quote the source, then that's fine. And I think the beginning of my my rabbinate was playing with different voices and different ideas um, and seeing what fit and what didn't fit and what worked and what didn't work. Um, you know, and look, and, and, and at various stages, certain things clicked. So um, going through a difficult period, whatever it was at one point, I mean, I learned to be passionate and not to be... Um, uh, reserved and not to be ashamed to be passionate in my in, in my speaking. Um, as I became more confident, I confident I learned not to rely on my notes as much. I would prepare, but people wanted you to talk to them and look them in the eye and, and have a conversation with them. 
Um, it wasn't an, an informal conversation, although sometimes it was as well. Um, but it was talking to them, not reading, not reading to them. And sometimes I think rabbis are too t- can be too tied to their notes, and it just falls. It just falls flat. There's a barrier that um, that exists um, that exists between yeah. them. And um, you know, as I became more comfortable in my own learning and my own and and, and the resources at my tip at the tips of my fingers and, and other types of things. So my base it expanded and I was able to feel more confident in the message that I wanted to share. Yeah. I, uh, I Svi Sinensky shared with me some of the, um, I, I don't know if either these are available to the public, but uh, some of the sermons and they had notes uh, from uh, Joseph Lookstein on them, uh, you know, and, and kind of like uh, debriefings after the sermon was, was delivered, you know, he'd say, uh, you know, uh, J JL like this or JL didn't like, or should have said this or, you know, and uh, yeah. it was very interesting to, to see the, the evolution. Right. That, that was that was in the very, very beginning when he was an assistant to, uh, to to Joseph Lookstein. But even when he was on his own, he would make his own notes as to what worked, what didn't work. And Rabbi Lamb worked very, very hard. He took things very, very seriously. He worked very hard and he was very self-critical. And um, well, we could see the results of, of what that was. I, I had a, an interesting experience early in my career. I was uh, I was the founding rabbi in Boca Raton. At a time now, it's an Irva Ambi Israel. In those days, there were 15 families that uh, that 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 were that started the shul, that 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 were involved with the shul. The closest mikvah was South Beach, Miami, which was an hour and a half drive in each direction. Um, butcher shops, the school, nothing, nothing was there. Uh, but I was very fortunate to meet um, Rabbi um, Menachem Sachs from the Associated Talmud Torahs in uh, in Chicago. Um, his son was, had retired from the rabbinate in Philadelphia and then was in Deerfield Beach. Um, and um, Rabbi Sachs has a couple of volumes of Drush that he published, uh, Menachem, Menachem Sion, that are out. And if anybody's listening and wants to see really clever, good Drush, um, find those books. You know, uh, just really- last night I heard it for the first time, uh, Leonard Matanke. Rabbi yeah. Matanke, yeah. Yeah, so uh, he was really, he was great. And at a certain point, he was in a, um, a, a, re- a re- rehabilitation home, not far from where I was on Shabbat. So I would go Shabbat afternoon. And I was, this is my third year in the rabbinate. That was, uh, that was a really wet behind the ears. And um, I would go visit him. And uh, he said, so tell me, what did you say today? And I would very proudly tell him what I said. And he said, oh, this is what you should have said. And he went on, and to this day, I still I still quote him a couple of pieces. That uh, one piece especially, um, he um, talks about saying "Ose Shalom" at the end of Kaddish or the end of Shemona Esrei. He says, and when and he asks the question, when we say "Ose Shalom," how do you, we take three steps back and we bow in one direction and the other direction? He says, why why is that the case? And and his response was that because if you want to create peace, you can't stand. Your ground. You can't stand stand firmly in your place and refuse to budge. But in order to create peace, what do you have to do? First, take three steps back, and then look at the situation from one direction, and then look at the situation from a second from another direction, and then maybe there's a chance there's a chance to create peace. It's a beautiful, yeah. powerful. Uh, not only is the drush good, but the imagery is great. And when I you deliver it, you, you take the three steps back, and you. Uh, my first sermon when I came to Stanford. Um, Connecticut, as there was a rabbi, used that piece. Uh, a week or two later, there was an issue that came up, and I was not willing to compromise my um, on, on the position. And a woman called me up and says, Rabbi Dratch, take three steps back. <laughs> so uh, once in a while, people actually listen to what you have to say. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, so in the very beginning, did, who did you draw from uh, as an influence? Uh, had, had you been exposed to Rabbi Lamb? Um, well, I hadn't really been exposed to him as a preacher. Yeah, uh, but I would share things with him. I would say, I would write up my sermons and send them to him, and they would come back with more red ink than the black ink on the page. Um, when he would come for the Shabbos, just a regular Shabbos, uh, to be with the family, and and I had to speak when he was present, um, and he was kind and generous and warm and uh, and accepting and forgiving and for very forgiving. Uh, but I was more nervous than Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur combined. Um, a lot of rabbis pressure. Know what that, rabbi knows what rabbis know what that's like, um, and um, so he was a very big, uh, very big and important influence um, 
for me in in that than just reading a lot. As mentioned, I, when I stumbled across Menachem Sachs, he became an influence. Um, there were who who were it would be um, Amiel, if, uh, if who was the chief rabbi in Tel Aviv, uh, has a couple of uh, volumes, uh, Drashot El Ami. If people can get a hold of those, they're in Hebrew, but the but the drush and the sophistication of development is really very special. So I think that he was uh, he was good. And then things that I had heard from other from other colleagues that uh, that along the way um, made an impression. In terms of the public speaking aspect, did you where did you draw from uh, in order you know let's say uh, rhetoric and things like that? Uh, where where did you draw from? So I think there are a, there are a couple of things. So one another Rabbi Lamb story. <laughs> um, at one point, uh, there was a member of his uh, of his shul that was into producing movies and shows and those types of things, and he was developing a uh, film of um, Saturday the Rabbi Slept Late. So all these series of mysteries of this rabbi and uh, and um, Dustin Hoffman was chosen to play the rabbi, but Dustin Hoffman had not been a shul goer. So he didn't know what it was like to be in a shul and listen to a rabbi. So he actually came to the Jewish center one Shabbat morning and sat with his producer and, and watched Rabbi Lamb in action to see what, what, what it is and what a rabbi does. And then after davening, actually came to the Lamb's home for Shabbos lunch uh, to be able to debrief after that. And he said that Hoffman walked in was very, very even shorter than Rabbi Lamb was, who was not a tall, was not a tall person, and uh, wearing a fur coat. And uh, he says, Rabbi Lamb, I, I, I get it now. You're like a, a conductor, a conductor of an orchestra. Um, and uh, you move your hands and your body language, your position and your movements and your and, and the way you use your voice. And Rabbi Lamb said, thought for a second, says, you know what? You're right. <laughs> that's what uh, that's what it is. So, um, as I said before, I was very fortunate to be exposed to a very good rabbi growing up. Um, I'd seen other people, and I just kind of picked up things along the way. Um, I also was very fortunate to have a very good voice coach. Um, I found that uh, after Shabbat, and especially after the Chagim, I had no voice left. I was never trained properly into how to breathe and, and how to project and... and um, and, and how to speak properly. I had a couple of very good voice coaches who um, helped me know what it was to breathe, gave me permission to slow down, to breathe properly, to phrase to, to phrase things properly. We worked on uh, on delivery, and um, that made a that made a very big difference. Yeah, what would you say is if you could look at the span of your speaking career? Uh, it, what was the biggest change over the arc of the beginning, you know, through through the last uh, position? Well, so it was interesting. I think part of it, you know, as I as I saw myself differently as a rabbi, as um, I realized what a sermon could do in terms of connecting with people, uh, what a sermon couldn't do, um, and so not biting off too much or being too fire and brimstone. Uh, once in a while, though, it's good to get it out of your system. Um, I think that, that made a difference. And as the audience changed, so I went from um, a small, as I mentioned, Boca Raton had 15 families. So the kind of sermon you could give and the kind of delivery you could have in a in a, in a rented lunchroom in a local elementary school, at the local elementary school, it was very different than what you could have when I went to KJ and worked with Rabbi Lukstein for two years in you know, a, a cathedral. Um, and then going to Toronto where um, you know the shul held, uh, had 900 or 1,000 seats. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, I spoke to 2,000 people. Um, it's a different, um, you know, it's, it's a very, very different kind of experience. And I think I really hit the peak or began to hit the peak when, in, in my Toronto experience. Because not only did we have the shul, but I had a real message. Um, for all intents and purposes, I was the representative of modern orthodoxy, not just in the shul, but in the city. And um, had a lot of support from, from Balabatim. Uh, it was a shul that was uh, that was important because there were Balabatim there that were involved in many um, Israeli institutions and organizations, um, other things in the city. And so it, it became a, it became a, 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 a place of influence. Um, and so I learned how to 
toy with that and play with that and the message that I was able to deliver uh, because of that. And so I took it. Um, so I, I took it very seriously. And, yeah. Uh, enjoyed really just enjoyed doing it. One of one of the things I'm always curious about is is that is is the um, is the sermon for you a message first, and then you find the Torah to support the message, or is it uh, Torah first, the, the parsha first? You go looking for something, and you find the message there, uh, and that and that that influences the what's going to be the sermon. I think it depended on the week. I think it depended on the week. Um, you know, and and the message was an important one. Uh, remember, my my wife Zechron Livracha said to me at one point along the way, she said, "You know, stop speaking about Shabbos, Kashrus, and Taras Hamishpach. There are many other important points that you have to uh, that you have to have." And it was true. So it forced me to go to go out of that stereotypical comfort zone for Orthodox rabbis, which became which became important. And then as I became more engaged in issues. Um, so they found their voice either directly or indirectly in the um, in the sermons. So uh, a whole bunch of years ago, I came across a couple of cases of child abuse in the, in the, in the Jewish community, and that created a whole other avenue for me in my career and in my rabbit and my communal involvement and all kinds of things. But I looked for opportunities to talk about uh, these interpersonal relationships, about protecting the weak and the innocent, um, and what our responsibility. It also changed the way I spoke um, under chuppahs, and it changed the way I spoke before before Yisker. Because uh, the, the typical Yisker speech, the stereotypical Yisker speech is now we're getting together to remember these our mothers and our fathers who were so good and who sacrificed for us and were loving and who were kind. And there are a lot of people sitting there whose parents weren't so loving and kind. Um, so what I said and how I said it started to recognize um, the different people that were sitting in the pews with their experiences um, that didn't fit that didn't fit the mold, that who who needed to be addressed and who who were feeling uh, guilt and anger and all kinds of things before Yisker that often didn't you know hadn't spoken about from the pulpit in in, in, in a Yisker sermon but had to be acknowledged. So it was a very fine line. Um, between, you know, you're, you're, you're addressing many different types of people. And that helped me understand also that when I got up to speak, you know, there's a lot of different people out there with different agendas. I remember sometimes people coming over to me from opposite sides of an issue saying, Rabbi, you really gave it to them this week. It was the same sermon. And each was convinced that I was, you know, giving it to the other side, um, which may mean that I wasn't articulating myself properly. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, how do you speak to different to to, to different people um, with different political or religious backgrounds, with different personal backgrounds and 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 and, ex and, and experiences and traumas that are going on, and different levels of religiosity? I mean, all of the shuls that I served, the big shuls, especially in Toronto and and in Stanford, had a wide variety of religious background and and commitment, and I had to be able to speak and share a sophisticated idea. For people who understood and appreciated that, but that could, was also open and accessible to a person who had very little background, and that yeah. became part of the challenge. And uh, eventually, I think I kind of figured that out. Yeah. What are some of the goals for the various uh, speaking slots throughout the year? So you know, you have the week to week drasha, you have a Shabbos shuva, you have a uh, you know the, the whole marathon with the, the Kol Nidre and the Rosh Hashanah and the uh, you know, leading up to uh, an Ela and then and and a Hespid and 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 a wedding. Like, do you have defined goals for each of those uh, uh, slots? I I'm not sure there were specifically defined goals for each of those slots. There were certain things. Rosh Hashanah called for a certain type of sermon of, of great importance. Rabbi Lamb once said to me, he "says Rabbis make a very big mistake. He says they over prepare for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur." And they spend so much time thinking about it and worrying about it that it falls flat. And he says, his advice was just give a very good Shabbos drasha and you'll hit a home run. Uh, and, don't, and, and, and don't worry about it. Um, I used to go crazy. I mean, I was, my summers, when the summer would come, I would start worrying about Rosh Hashanah. But that's all that I would do because I would never get around to actually, I would start to write and throw it away and it's a terrible experience. And, and it wasn't until much later that things began to gel. So then I gave myself permission uh, to wait till after Tisha B'Av, because then you had seven weeks and you could, 
and that was also too much time to to, to to do it. But look, there were there were important things. I mean, it also taught great humility because uh, I didn't know more than and probably knew less than um, world politics than many people sitting uh, listening to me. So to think that I could tell them how to read the, it, it, it was true a generation or two before that where the Balabatim were mostly unlearned and the rabbi was the, the only one in the shul that had the college education. So he would part, he would the darsh in the New York Times for, for the people that were there. And that was important for them to understand how to understand the world and perceive the world and react to the world through, tar, through a Torah lens. Well, our Balabatim today know a lot more about the world than many of many of we rabbis do, and some of them are bigger talmidei chachamim than some of the rabbis that are uh, that, 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 that are darshaning. So uh, I learned as time went by to have a, 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 a huge dose of humility uh, in terms of what I wanted to do, but it, but at the same time felt it was important not to be political, but to address the the moral and ethical issues that. The current events and that politics were were, um, were were presenting to us, and the religious issues that um, that that the, that are the community was facing, and the Israel issues that, the, that the, there was there was no lack of 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 of, um, of themes and of uh, of ideas that had to you know that had to be addressed. And once in a while, if I had a really good creative piece of drush, I would have to. Figure out like the uh, like the Dubner Magid story of shooting the arrow and then drawing the uh, the circles around it. So you know, I was guilty of doing that as well. Yeah, um, how important was it for you to be original uh, versus uh, f finding something, let's say, you know, finding a Ramban or finding a you know a nice idea in the Sieve or something like that, and, and presenting that versus uh, coming up with your own uh, original thought? Well, that was part of the challenge and the fun for me is to be original. Um, you know, look, we have to get some benefit from it as well. I remember in the middle of some sermons thinking to my, like being like, like almost like an out of body, uh, experience, observing what I was doing and listening to what I was saying. And I, what the hell are you talking about? Like, get the, I couldn't stop. I was in the middle of the sermon, but like, this is really not doing anything. And you really had no right to get up in the first place. Um, but, um, uh, look, we, we, I think that, you know, the rabbis and if a rabbi doesn't enjoy um, the sermon, and if the sermon he's delivering is not the kind of sermon he would want to listen to, then he shouldn't either. He shouldn't be delivering sermons at all, or he shouldn't be certainly should certainly should not be delivering that particular that particular sermon. Um, but you know, to be inspired by a ramban or an itziv or something else is certainly appropriate, and to use that in a creative way, I think that's I think that's uh, that's important. Um, you know, sermons sometimes were opportunities to teach. I think too many, uh, Rabbi Lamb has this wonderful essay about the, uh, the uh, called the unrepentant darshan. Anybody yeah, seen... who gets darshan should memorize. I mean, it's, it's a great, it's a great piece. Um, I think sermons are a valuable art form. Um, I think too many uh, of our, of the younger rabbis think that it's passe and would rather just give a shir or a dvar Torah. But a sermon is not a shir or devar Torah. And there were times Shabbat morning that I would deliver this, uh, an a, a, a small shir or a uh, or, or devar Torah because you want to mix things up and you want to share it. There were times, um, especially in, in Stanford towards the end of my rabbinate there, when I would pose a question and people would give ideas. And it was like I played game show host uh, for the – and it was fun. I wouldn't do that all the time, but it was fun. And then there were a few times we would bring the – young kids in from junior congregation, have them sitting on the steps on the way up to the uh, to the Bima. And like Art Linkletter used to do, if anybody remembers him, you know, and, and ask the kids questions. And it was great. I mean, that, those were that, those were fun as well. So I try to mix things. We try to mix things up along. So what do you feel is, is the purpose of, of, of the sermon uh, that you say that, uh, you, you know, maybe the new generation doesn't uh, have the same reverence or, or appreciation for it? What 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 do you, in your opinion, is the, is the purpose of the sermon? I, I think um, people want to be inspired. I think that I used to joke with the Chazan of the Shul is that every Rosh Hashanah Kippur, he gets to say the same words every year. He says, the rabbi, I've got to make up a new sermon every year. And he doesn't <laughs> say. So um, it, it varies the davening experience, um, especially in Shul. Well, look, 
I, I've been going to shul for quite a number of years, and I and, and I know davening, but I'd like to be inspired. And I think it's a, I, I think it's a, a few moments in which a person can really find inspiration. We made Aliyah this past summer, finding a shul that in which we felt comfortable and in which we felt we belong was very difficult. And there are plenty of minyanim, and there are many of buildings that call themselves shuls, you know, where, but lacking that sermon, lacking that that. The, the, the intentionality of inspiration uh, was lacking for us. It took us a long time to find the right place to uh, to, to daven. Um, so that's part of it. Part of it is sending an agenda, you know, challenging the community in terms of setting agendas for the community. Uh, part of it is comforting people at, a, at difficult times. So I, this is, you know, post October 7th. I uh, can imagine the kinds of sermons that the rabbis are delivering because the, com- the community is looking for inspiration and looking for comfort and looking for a way to deal with this mess in which we find ourselves in Israel and all over the world with anti-Semitism and everything that's going on. So I think that's important. And part of it is educational as well. It's a great opportunity, uh, the right way to be able to teach a message and hopefully inspire people along the way to move on to, uh, to other things. Hey there, fellow podcast listeners. Are you enjoying the show so far? I hope you're finding value in all the insightful conversations coming your way. And I'm grateful for all the time we get to spend together. Now, I have a small favor to ask, one that can make a big difference. By taking the moment to rate and review this podcast, you're not only showing your support, but also helping it reach new heights. Picture this, more reviews means more visibility. More visibility means more incredible guests lining up to share their stories and expertise with you. So, if you're enjoying what you're hearing, how about making some magic happen? Scroll down, tap that rating, jot down a few words, it's that simple. Your action today can pave the way for even greater experiences tomorrow. Thanks for your support. Now let's get back to the program. I think the rabbis over the generation have been successful in doing that. One of Rabbi Lamb's sermons uh, hidden away somewhere was uh, quoted a Vilna Gaon on the concept of mate mitzvah. So what a, so in, in, in this drush, a mate mitzvah were those mitzvot that people generally didn't pay attention to, that didn't have the mazel of, uh, of being very of being very popular. And the examples he gave at the upper in the Upper West Side of Manhattan and at the Jewish Center in the 1960s was Nitilat Yadayim and Birkat Hamazon, and things that in the average Orthodox community today we just take for you know got their mazel. And there are other things that maybe are uh, are, are not paid attention to. But you know he was able to use the the the, the pulpit as a means of education to to nudge people to become you know, to, to consider becoming more more committed uh, in in the ways that that spoke to them. I think that yeah. that's part of what we can do as well. What are, in your opinion, what are some of the uh, the boundaries of of, of uh, drush? Uh, you know, because w- when when you start to become creative with with Torah ideas, uh, you risk uh, kind of you know spinning off into uh, things that may may not even be what the Torah had in mind, you know? And, and so, so where, w- you know, what, what serves, what, h- how do you, how do you decide what, what's, what's acceptable and what's not? Right. So that also took time to learn. You know, I tried things and they, they fell flat and they, and they, and they weren't as compelling to the, to, 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 to the people who listened that as they were to me when I thought it was a brilliant idea. So that's, uh, although everybody has their own style. So if you take a look at, uh, you know, at Hasidic Torah, there are no boundaries. You know, everything means something else, and you wonder how you got from point A sometimes to point B. But it worked for an audience and sometimes can be very uh, meaningful and challenging. But I don't go in for gimmicks. I think that that's, uh, you, know, you have a word with three letters, and the three letters stand for three concepts. Uh, uh, you know, to me, that's not very, that's not, that's not compelling because it doesn't come from the, it doesn't come from the text. But if, if from the text, the Pasuk or the Midrash or the Gemara or whatever it may be, you find something that really is compelling and people can say, oh, I, you know, I can see where you got it. And I never saw that before in that text. And wow, that's absolutely amazing. I think then that's, um, I think that that works. I think the Amunat Videa would have to be in line with our Masorah and, uh, and that's for sure. But within that, there's certainly a lot of room to, uh, if you say Shivin Panim Torah, then every, Everything is is, you know, is is multi-layered, and I once said um, in explaining to my a number of times, but it, it, my daughter overheard me say that, um, that, that 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 the verse was pregnant with meaning. So she says, "I have no idea what that meant." <laughs> 
but it's true it is and look not everything that uh that a that a critic of Shakespeare sees in a in, in a sonnet or in a in a play did he actually think of, but it, it was latent in the text, and I think the same that's the same thing is true with uh, wonderful material that we um, that that we have. Uh, Joe Lookstein was quoted to me as saying that um, used to go to um, to hear some of the pro the great Protestant preachers uh, in Manhattan in, in its day who were really known for great sermons and delivery and, and all kinds of things. And he was amazed they had no material to work with. All they had was a Bible. And look, look what we have and look at the great opportunities that we have to be able to uh, to do these things. And it's, uh, so we have. And I think if we're, um, some of the, the Divrei Torah that I had heard from Rabbi Lamb in the name of his grandfather, Rabbi Yehoshua Bamel, and of his uncle, Rabbi uh, Joseph Bamel, that were, it was drush that came out of halacha. I mean, some of the and, and powerful and meaningful and powerful, and it it gives you a whole other. You know, when I would learn, then so I would learn as a just as learning, and then I would always with the rabbi voice in the back of my head, what can I do with this? Um, but sometimes some really great stuff comes out of uh, out of real meat and potato gemaras, and that's uh, that's always a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah, I uh, I came across one of Rabbi Lamb's sermons where he talked about uh, the three types of uh, uh, kosher birds. Uh, I don't know, you familiar with that one? Yeah, yeah. which is uh, uh, so masterful. And uh, you look at it, you say, you know, how could someone be able to pull that out of out of a, out of a Gemara uh, right. to apply to American orthodoxy in uh, you know in the 1950s? It was just uh, uh, it was very very impressive. Yeah. It, was a great, it was a great uh, Rosh Hashanah sermon from his uh, from his grandfather, his uncle. I forgot who was this story about um, about a uh, in the laws of Shomrim. And a person goes to a Shomer to a Shomer Chinam and gives him jewels to watch, and he comes back and uh, to to retrieve them. And the, and the Shomer says, "Lo yadana." I don't know. And the line of the Gemara is "Call lo call call lo yadana right, right. The Gemara above the Kipi. And that became, you know, what does it mean, you know, yodim? What does it mean when Yosef goes out to Mitzrayim with Svat lo yadati yeshma? So a person says, I don't know, I don't care, I'm not paying attention. And that it, I mean, it's brilliant, but it's it's rooted, which is a really an amazingly wonderful, uh, wonderful kind of thing. One of the great, the greatest sermons I think that he gave, and it, you can read it now, you hear the words, the to bounce off the page, you can hear his voice as it was his uh, drusha um, called "If I Were a Prophet." It was a Rosh Hashanah sermon or a Yom Kippur sermon in which he compares Moshe and Aharon, the priest and the prophet, and how the Moshe, as the Ish Emet, as the um, as the um, as the prophet, demands truth and demands what is right and demands what is good. And so he comes down from the mountain. He sees that the Bnei Israel are worshiping the eagle, and he breaks the tablets into pieces. And our own is the prophet who was an Oev Shalom and a Rodev Shalom and who understands and who is forgiving and who goes and gathers up those pieces of the, 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 of the broken stones to put them together again. And then he goes on to this whole thing. If I were a prophet, I would say, and he says exactly what a rabbi wanted to say to a shul. But at last, I'm only a priest and therefore I understand that. But if I were a prophet, I would. It, it's brilliant. It's just a brilliant kind of thing. And it's, uh, it's inspired and it's inspiring. Yeah, so I've been told that the uh, the Rav uh, was had you know people perceive him as kind of a halachic personality, but uh, but that he had this uh, uh, he, someone maybe it was Rabbi Sinensky who said he he dripped with drush. He, he that that <laughs> that's that, cute. That, so, saying that, um, yeah, that uh, so, so maybe if you could describe that a little bit that. Uh, um, the so difference where my lamb writes in that essay of, of the unrepentant um, darshan that he was inspired by the three J's. It was his uh, grandfather. It was his um, his uncle Joshua Bamel. Uh, I'm sorry, Joseph Bamel. It was Joseph Lukstein, and it was Joseph Soloveitchik. Those were the those were the, his three inspirations when it came to when it came to Jewish. And uh, yeah, if you, if you can, especially at the time of his at times of his um, his tshuva drasha or his yard site drasha. We would get into we get into drush, and you can see some of the some, somebody is publishing some videos now uh, with um, the uh, recordings of some of the stuff that the Rav had done. But they're all, mostly all in Yiddish, but they're with subtitles, and you can hear the creativity of the drush that he uh, 
that he had. He's not, and he's not known for that. I mean, it's unfortunate. The Rav was so, uh, it was an Isha Eshkolot, uh, you know, Isha HaKolbo is so varied. And whether it was in Lambdas or it was in Drush or it was in philosophy or it was uh, whatever. And he had very few students who appreciated the, to the totality of who and what he was. So most of them, under, you know, appreciated him more as a typical uh, Eastern European Rosh Yeshiva. And that's a halachist, and that's what has survived to a large degree. But there were other students of his that appreciated the philosophy or the drush or other types of things and, and saw the, the, the different uh, layers, the multi-layers that, that made up Rabbi Soloveitch. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if there's any times that, that uh, maybe uh, your sermons got you in trouble, uh, so, something that you said or something that uh, you did or something that rub, rubbed people the wrong way that, that you had to kind of massage and, and, you know, uh, work through. Sure. Look, if you, if you take a stand and you have an opinion, if you have no opinion, then nobody can disagree, but then everything falls flat. If you have an opinion, people will disagree. And um, you have to give them, you have to thank them for that. I would always say that the biggest uh, compliment of a sermon was that people came and talked about it afterwards, either to each other or to me and agreed or whatever. But there were times when I went too far. Um, I remember one time in, it's still early in my rabbinate in this small shul in Schenectady that uh, I use the, um, the measurish of Hashem going to each of the nations and offering them the Torah and each one wanting to know what was written in it and rejecting it. And I, I became a little bit too politically incorrect. And I thought it was cute, but it insulted some people. And somebody came out with me actually right afterwards. And then I got up right after Musaf and apologized. Um, I think we need to do that. We need to be able to do that. Uh, and take responsibility for when we misspeak. First of all, it's good modeling of appropriate behavior, but if we're wrong, we're wrong. And we have no right as, as, as a rabbi to get up and and, 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 and and insult people or turn people off. I mean, people's, uh, you know, the state of their religious personalities and the future of their commitment is, can be impacted. We don't have a lot, we don't have a lot of power in that, but sometimes, sometimes it can, both Latov, but also Lara. And we have no mm -hmm. right to do that. Yeah. What were, um, how often did, did things that happened in your experiences uh, find their way into, into your drashas, you know, personal experiences or, or uh, you know, things you were dealing with throughout the week uh, in pastoral uh, capabilities? Right. So they, I think they always had influences because, you know, we look for, we're influenced by the people around us and the things that we see and the things that we do. We can't help, we can't help but do that. And, um, I'm not a great storyteller. So I, I used to think, you know, I'll become a rabbi all of a sudden, I'll know great jokes and I'll know great stories that I can use in my sermons. And I'm not a great storyteller, but when I had a good story, it, uh, that's the old line, Aloha Medrash Ha'ikar Ela Hamaisa. It's not the drush, it's the, it's the story that, and people respond to that. So I would try to find, to find those things and try to tell stories, you know, that included uh, some of my kids, didn't mind if I would tell, share things about them. And one daughter said, Daddy, do not speak about me. And I don't give you permission to speak about me in your, in your sermon. But there were some great stories. I remember being in Stanford. My son was, um, I think, four, three or four years old. And he came up and I see him running back and forth on the beam of looking behind chairs. And, and he looked concerned. I said, what are you, what's going on, Sam? What's happening? He says, I'm looking for Hashem and I can't find him. Well, that was a great Yom Kippur story, a uh, sermon. I mean, it was a great story and it resonated and, uh, you know, it was, um, it really, it really worked. It really worked well. Uh, another story was um, my kids were in Ghan and my daughter comes to me and says, Daddy, is it true? Were you, were you really a slave in Egypt? So like, what do you say? So I said, uh, of course we were all slaves. So I have, she's one of triplets. So it, my my son, who I told the story about before, was also in the same class, and he was a little more cynical at that age. And he says, "You know, what are you talking about? You were really a slave." It's as if we were slaves. So my daughter looked at me with these eyes that my father lied to me, he betrayed me. I'm never going to believe a single word that he says ever again to me. Um, that was also a good sermon. Yeah. Um, what I found also worked very well is that sometimes after a sermon, somebody would come over to me, and share an idea that was inspired and another other way of looking at the pasuk or another idea and sometimes they were brilliant 
And sometimes they weren't and you had to smile and say thank you very much. But sometimes they were really great. And to this day, I'll actually, I'll actually, you know, incorporate that quote, not only quote the idea, but quote the person who shared the idea. It was I remember the sermon, it was um on, on, on Manishtana. So um the, 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 the Tosefta says, you pour the second cup, the Khan had Ben Shoel, and if there's no son, his wife asks, and if there's no, he asks himself, and it, it says, then it, it, it ends, Afilu Shnei Tamidei Chachamim Shoalim Zelazeh. So two scholars have to ask each other. So I don't understand. All you need is one person to ask so the other person can answer. So why do we say that the two Tamidei Chachamim Shoalim Zelazeh, they have to ask each other? So I said, it's rather cynically, because if you get two rabbis together, who's going to ask and who's going to answer? Neither <laughs> one is going to want to be in the position to feel that you know he has something to learn from the other. And that it was a good springboard for, for a good drasha about uh, something actually Rav Chaim Velazhner says in his commentary on Pirkei Avot, where he says, what are they doing? So they're not discussing sports or the current events. They're learning. But they're not learning. They're not sharing Torah with each other. So their Torah is valueless. You have to be able to share it. And um, anyway, that was that was the sermon. So this Phyllis Shapiro comes over to me afterward and says, when you quoted that, I thought of the Karaza Elzeh, Shoalim Zelazeh, that the angels ask each other. It says that when two rabbis can share and ask each other questions, that's the song of angels. So I've repeated that many times, and that was a better drusha than I gave, and it was inspired. Yeah. And so, thank people sometimes yeah, actually listen to what we say and uh, have what to teach us as well. That's great. That's great. I saw Rabbi uh, Lamb some some of his uh, uh, drushas. They have uh, stories and jokes in them that that they're. You wonder where where did he get these from? Because they were they were some of them were so brilliant. I'll, I'll give an example of one of them. Where uh, this was the uh, inauguration, the Hanukkah Sabayas of the shul in Springfield, I guess that he had left, uh, and he came back for the inauguration, and, and he addressed them, and he tells the story about uh, a building campaign uh, where you know you know the story where uh, where they're trying to raise funds for the building, and, and the richest person you know raises his hand and says, "I, I pledge twenty five dollars," and as he's saying this, uh, a piece of plaster falls off and hits him on the head. And so, uh, so he looks up and he raises his hand again. He says, okay, I, I give a hundred dollars. And so the rabbi says, uh, uh, God hit, hit him again. You <laughs> <laughs> wonder where did, where does he find these stories? Where did he, did he make them he up? Was, he, he was a person who never wasted a second, not just didn't waste a minute, did not waste a second. Um, and who read everything and who was aware of everything and kept notes. And that was that was part of the brilliance also and kept a file of the stories or the ideas that he had and an index of how to find them. So when he needed them, he knew where he knew where to look. He had a little uh, binder where he would write these where the stories down a little port lock and this. I have that on my shelf. It's a very precious, uh, it's a very precious thing. Um, but he would he had an ear, he had just had an ear for it. And uh, he and he also had a great sense of humor. He was a great punster. So when he heard these things, they stayed with him and he looked for them because they resonated with him. Yeah, yeah. So tell me how, in in your estimation, how, how is the um, the sermon evolved? Uh, I mean, it, it seems like uh, uh, the speaking slot has, has uh, narrowed. You know, pe people don't have the same attention span anymore as they used to. Um, ha have the goals changed? Have the styles changed um, much? Uh, you know, wh where do you see the, the future headed for the sermon? Right. So the styles have certainly changed and the time slot has they used to a sermon going back to the 1940s and 1950s was at least a half an hour long. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur was 45 minutes, was an hour. I mean, this was, uh, and, you know, people would go to Shul Rosh Hashanah and knock it out till two or three in the afternoon between the Chazin and the, and the rabbi. It was a whole day. It was a whole day affair, but they had no other entertainment. I mean, they, uh, they, they didn't have televisions and there were, they did eventually, and they didn't have their smartphones. They didn't have uh, sound bites and, and those types of things. So they they, they appreciated that. Um, the sermons, I think, of those previous generations were less sophisticated Torah wise. There were some great rabbis doing some great stuff, but they were less. The audiences were less sophisticated, and the rabbis didn't share lots of Torah. The Torah was just the the, the hechitimsa for giving the rest of the rest of the sermon. 
Um, I, I think at a, at a certain point, as the audiences became more sophisticated and more knowledgeable, and as the rabbis became more sophisticated and more knowledgeable, it evolved into, um, in certain cases, some ser you know, serious uh, opportunities to share to share sources. And look, it depended on the um, the abilities of the rabbi himself and his own learning. Rabbi Lamb once said to me that uh, he would, when he looked around yeshiva when he was a student, it was very hard to predict who was going to be the the, the, the better rabbi or the less better rabbi. So since some of the students who did not do well in yeshiva and weren't the greatest lamdanim became excellent rabbis because they knew how to talk to people, they knew how to communicate, they had a certain charisma, they had a certain style, and so it was a success. And, um, you know, it's when the Pasuk says, Dor, Dor, Vador, Shav, so the Medr says that Hashem showed Adam HaRisho and every generation and the leader, they got the leader that it deserved. But I think it should, Dor, Dor, Vador, Shav, every generation gets the darshan that... Uh, that, that they deserve because the, the language changes. The language is the language is different, and the and the sermons of the 1950s and 1960s didn't go over a couple of a uh, couple of decades later. And I think the shift you're seeing towards more divrei Torah and shiurim and not drush is because there's a different kind of of generation that thinks it has different needs. I think it's I think they're wrong, but it doesn't mean they're going to listen to me. They're going to listen to what they uh, to what they want to listen to. And um, our attention span has changed. You could never give a sermon for half an hour today. They would they would lynch you, uh, and they would lynch you in the middle. Um, you know, it's uh, that was the story of the rabbi who was speaking, and as he's speaking, going on and on and on. If slowly but surely, one person left, another person left, and before you know it, the, the only person left was the shamus. And eventually, he gets up, he takes the keys out of his pocket, he puts it on the day, says to the rabbi, "When you're finished, would you please lock up?" <laughs> you know, people don't have that. So a rabbi can't get up today and give a sermon that's more than 12, 13 minutes. Uh, the people just, um, it just it just can't happen. So he has to say what he has to say. And it's got to come out differently. It's got to get to the point. Uh, and Rabbi Lamb was with me one Shabbos in Stamford. So there were two minyanim. So I would give my sermon in the upstairs minyan. But the earlier minyan in the in the in the in the base medrash in the in, in the first floor, you know, started earlier, and they didn't want the pomp and circumstance. They didn't want the, but I would go and I would give a tamsit of my drasha in two minutes. So we walked in. I gave my right lamb was sitting in the back listening to me. I walk. I says that was terrible. My heart dropped. Like oh my god. Like what did I do? And I have an hour and a half to figure out to do something better. He says, what do you mean? What was what was wrong? He says, if you could do that in two minutes. You know, it's Motsi Laws and all the rabbis that take 15 minutes or 20 minutes to give the same sermon. Um, so you have to, look, the time is precious, and you have to use that time with great, you know, you have to have respect for your audience. Um, and, uh, but it's, I think, I think those things have changed. I think all that being said, I think people still like to be inspired. And if it's the right person with the right message in the right way, then um, there's still, there's still room. I hope there's still room for that. Yeah. I'm curious, maybe you could uh, help me understand the history a little, a little bit about, th there seemed to have been uh, historically uh, kind of like a, a competition a little bit between the chazan and the, and the rabbi. There's, they always have this uh, kind of a cat and mouse uh, type of relationship. Uh, you know, I'm trying to over generalizing, but, uh, but that, that seems to have been the, you know, dynamic. Uh, what, what do you attribute that to? Well, and the Medrash says, malachim You know, so each one wanted to, his time and place. And the um, look, the the rabbi was dependent upon the chazan not going over time with the chazanas because he needed the time for his drasha, and the chazan needed the rabbi not to go over time with his drasha because he needed time to be able to daven. So there was a, a kind of a natural kind of competition there. I think there are many rabbis who would like to have like to have been the chazan as well. Um, and uh, I think there are some chazam who would like to have been the rabbi as well. So it I think it really depended on the personalities and the yeah, there's some horror stories that uh, that can be told uh, with regard to those relationships. I was very fortunate in most of the places where I was where there was a chazam that we were friends and we got along well and we got um, there were a couple of times uh, we used the shul used to, in Toronto used to bring in a chazam for Hashem and Yom Kippur for, for, a, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, and the chazan was there to perform and didn't always respect. So it became, it was frustrating sometimes because to get up at a time when, you know, it's already late to have people listen to you is not, it's not fair to them either. You can't, uh, you can't do that. I was, after I left the rabbinate and 
was, I had started an organization fighting abuse in the Jewish community. I was teaching at YU and then eventually came into my position at, um, at the RCA. So I wasn't giving drushos every, every week. Once in a while, the rabbi of the shul, where I daven, would ask me to speak. So I, I enjoyed doing that. So once it was, it was a Shabbos, um, Shmini Atzeret. So you had, um, you, you had um, Yisker, you had Kohelet, because there was no Shabbat Cholom O'e that year, and you had uh, Halel, and yeah, I mean, it was, by the time it was ready for the drasha, it must have been after 12 o'clock, and nobody wanted to listen to a drasha. But I, so I said to them, I don't have to speak. It's like, no, no, the rabbi insists that you speak. So, and he was in a different minion. So I got up and I said, the time is really very late. Uh, and then Kohelet. So I'll just give you the gist of my drasha. Sof Davara called Nishma when all is said and done. At Lokim Yerav at Teratam Yisrael Tishma, whatever. I quoted the pasuk and I sat down. Well, it was like the best drush that anybody could have heard because it was short and it got the point across. The rabbi was not happy with me, <laughs> but um, you know, when they say Kishem Shem Kablim Sfar La Drisha, Kach Me Kablim Sfar La Prisha. You get scar for speaking. You get scar sometimes for not speaking. Also, yeah, and that's okay. Let's let's end on a high note. Uh, maybe recall for me one of the times that your your drasha really uh, landed or did accomplish something uh, beyond your expectations. Uh, something that uh, you know you look back on on your speaking career and as a, as a highlight and say, "Wow, that that was uh, that was a great uh, that was a great moment." Um, there were times when you know it's, uh, my modesty will not allow me to answer that question directly. Um, yeah, that you really felt that. An inspiration. I don't know where the words came from. I don't know how the phrase, the the the, the, the phrases and the terms of uh, the, 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 the terms of language and speech came about. But it was. It felt like it was just a vehicle for something that was much higher, which was really quite an experience. Um, and then bumping into Balabatim later on, um, visiting a community where I had served as a rabbi a number of years before, or bumping into somebody. So, rabbi, do you remember the time when you spoke about X? And they would go out, they would go on and they would quote the certain you know, parts of the sermon. I don't remember even thinking about what they were talking about, but it made a difference. You know, and if you can comfort somebody who needs comfort or inspire somebody who needs inspiration or challenge somebody who needs challenge at that moment, there's nothing, there's nothing greater. And to realize we're only a vehicle. Well, the, uh, the Navi is a mouthpiece. It's not his words, and it's not his. Uh, it's not his message, and it's not. And it's. It's only a vehicle to be able to do something for somebody or for a community at a certain point. And if you can do that, then that's uh, it makes everything else worthwhile. Amazing. Okay, I'll ask you two very quick questions. One is uh, uh, your favorite uh, sermon joke uh, that you uh, that you love. Or oh, I don't know. I'm not a. I, I, I'm not, good at jokes. I'm not good at jokes and stories. So it's yeah. uh, although there's one there's there's one great story that you would use as the beginning of a speech. Um, actually, it's um, in the Breuer's community, which is in Washington Heights near near YU. There was a um, a uh, Tanakh shir every Monday night, and they had finished a certain sefer. They asked Rabbi Schwab to come and be part of the seum. So he accepted the invitation, and he told the following story. He said that. Um, uh, one of the Balabatim called him up with a shila. He says he loves going to the shear. He enjoys the shear, but it's very late on Monday night and he works very hard. And when he goes, he usually falls asleep. So is it better for him to stay home and not go? Is it better for him to go and fall asleep in the shear? So Rabbi Schwab said that um, he answered him that we have in our tradition that when a person falls asleep, it's the Shema goes up to Shemaim before the Kisei kavod to give the din v'cheshbon as to what the person did all day. He said, so if you fall asleep on Monday night, Hashem will say, so no, what are you doing? You could either say I'm lying on the sofa with my feet up on the couch, or I'm attending a shear in the shul. So it's better to go to the shear and fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So I would use that sometimes to open up a, a speech and say, if you happen to fall asleep, so send, my, send my regards to God. You know, <laughs> Part of my problem now is it's hard for me to sit in shul and listen to a drasha because I've given many and I've heard I've heard the best. So it's hard sometimes to listen to other people. And uh... yeah, okay. All right. I, I feel like uh, th this was, so, you were so uh, rich with, with uh, a legacy and, and stories and, and, and information that uh, we might even have to do a part two at some point. <laughs> I, listen, I give you a lot of credit for doing this. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, it's a great chesed for rabbis. They get to talk about themselves and about things that they love. And yeah. it's been fun uh, reminiscing and, and talking Wonderful. about it. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah, maybe I'll come visit when, when I get there. It's all I'd love to. Please, uh, open invitation. You've been listening to The Magid Method, and I'm Daniel Steinberg. There's a secret that great public speakers know. Did you know there's a method for cutting straight through to an audience's heart, grabbing their attention and holding it, and making a memorable impact with your presentation? The best speakers in the world utilize it, and now you can too, every time you get up to speak. Download your free Magid Method of Public Speaking template at magidmethod.com, M-A-G-G-I-D-M-E-T-H-O-D.com. The Magid Method will teach you how to find your authentic voice, craft meaningful presentations, manage people's attention, and build unbreakable bonds with your audience. Go to magidmethod.com and download your free copy now.